Hi there and welcome to this special bonus edition of the Paul Ryder Tapes. There's still more of the main series to come, but this week, in honour of the fact that Paul's solo project Big Arms album Radiator has just been re-released, we're playing the interviews that I did with Paul's friends and collaborators, the Big Arm Boys. That's Pete Smith, the keyboardist, programmer and producer, Danny Shaw, the drummer, who's also an incredible mimic, and Daz Gilkinson, the ace guitarist, an all-round great lad, plus, of course, Lee Mullen, the percussionist extraordinaire, and Big Arm's fab roadie driver and tour assistant, Chris Connolly, also known as Double Pudding and Chips. Here, Daz recalls an incident that took place when Big Arm supported Ian Brown. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I can't remember which one it was um, <clears throat> with Ian Brown. And Paul had obviously told Ian Brown about Danny's mimicking skills. Yeah. So then yeah. Ian Brown comes rushing into the dressing room. Who's, yeah. Who's the mimic? Who's the mimic? Who's the so mimic? Who's the mimic? Danny, yeah. Danny here goes, <laughs> go on then. So he does Jules Holland, amazing. Introduces Ian Brown on Jules Holland. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then, then this is Ian Brown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since you last worked with the Roses, so, uh, yeah, yeah, and he was like, Oh, fucking great, man, great, great. And then, as soon as he walked out and shut the door, Danny started doing Ian Brown. <laughs> this is getting very confusing. Uh, my name's Pete Smith, and I first met Paul Ryder in 1992, and I saved the Mondays. Well, I was in a, a studio at Whitworth, and um. One night, the lad who ran the studio got a phone call off Pete Smith asking if he'd come down and do some backing vocals. So I think he asked me just to come along with him as a bit of support. Anyway, when we got down there, I met Pete um, and there were some guitars there. So Pete just said, why don't you have a go? About uh, two hours into the night, then Paul walks in. So I didn't even recognise him at all. You know, it was just like, one of you, mate. See, I was a bit of a rocker as a young'un, but my brother was completely Manchester. So when I went back and told him, and he's just like, it, it, mouth dropped, you know, do you know who he is? And I'm like, well, no, 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 not really. <laughs> then he filled in the gaps and showed me some footage and played some music, and it was like, oh, all right, I know what you mean. But I'm really glad I didn't know that before I met him. <laughs> Pete first met Paul through John Pennington, who was working with Paul and his then-girlfriend Estrella on some tunes. I was kind of hanging on and um, working in Strawberry part time, and um, and so I knew John uh, for that. I've been there a couple of years, and he said, um, "Oh, we've got this session around the corner with Paul Ryder." So I was like, well, "What is it?" So because all I knew was the Mondays up to that point, um, and I think he'd he'd been working with Paul on Bummed in Strawberry. Um, and that's how he kind of got to know Paul. And he said, oh, it's just, I don't know, it's like something he's doing like after the Monday split up. You know, I'd like someone to kind of get involved more producing and writing. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went round and we we wrote one of the Estrella tunes at that point. And I've met that. So that's when I met Paul basically with him and Estrella the start of the issue and like that sporadically writing songs um and then um and that's when donovan get got involved and said let's do this properly i'll put some money into it let's get it finished off and released we rented a little studio in new mount street in manchester and we kind of tried to uh get as many tracks finished as we could and then we went into the studio to mix them. And what happened was that um, Paul was um, falling off the wagon um, yeah. whilst this mixing session was happening. And uh, kind of Estrella was like, right, that's it, we're done. And then she got together with one of the rappers and Paul disappeared for a little while. And then we carried on and then... Uh, she basically she we mixed these seven tracks and she was like, right, I I don't like any of them and I've been like, well, I've just spent the last three years of my life doing this stuff. So at that point, 
right? I sold everything that I had, sold my sampler, sold my keyboards, everything, and was like, right, that's it with music now, I'm done. And then it was only when Paul rang me up um, a couple of years later and said, oh, I want to do some more stuff. And that's when Big Arm was formed. I first uh, met Paul um, on my audition for the Happy Mondays. It, there would have been a room with, in Greenhouse Studios with myself, Paul, Ben, Leach, the MD, and Gary Whelan. So my first impressions of Paul really were, um, he was the most welcoming, really. And we just, we, we didn't really play any, very many of the sort of Happy Mondays songs, I remember. I think we just, we just jammed. And he, and, um, and he was, Paul was, um, was a, made me feel very easy very quickly. And after us playing for maybe around 40 minutes or something, he said, Right, welcome to the family. You're in the band. You're Lee Percussion in the band. Brilliant. So that's what he said. And that's why I went on, um, that's went on to, to me playing, obviously, with uh, Big Arm and also um, playing in Buffalo 66 as well. So three bands, really. My name is Danny Short, and um, I first met Paul, I think it was in 2002, uh, when a mutual friend, uh, Rob Farrington, introduced the two of us. I used to house show with Rob and uh, obviously he knew that I was a musician and was always banging on about, you know, how he knew Paul and you need to meet him and maybe you could end up working with him at some point. So uh, I think Rob managed to drag him along to a gig. I got chatting to him and he mentioned that he was doing some music with Pete for the film 24 Hour Party People. And so uh, I went along, uh, my the first time I worked with Paul and Pete in the studio at Worsley was whilst they were making this track and I contributed a tiny little bit of guitar to the track. The next thing I know, uh, Paul rang me again and said, me and Pete have been working on some material, possibly for an album. Would you like to, you know, get involved with that? So I came along, did a bit of singing, playing guitar, some drums and those, uh, you know, what we did ended up becoming the Radiator album. They were like the demos for the album that became Radiator. So behind the scenes, Paul and Pete are cramming it in to try and get things going. Then I turn up and um, can you put anything to this? So I'd just get stuck in me. I'd just close my eyes and off I go. So as soon as I got what they were aiming at, I just flew at it then. And did you enjoy what you were making, what you were playing? Oh, it was wonderful. Love, I loved it and the way we did because we were always falling about laughing. You know, I always tried to get it right when we were doing it, but in between doing it, it was just uh, banter all the way. It was such an enjoyable band, that. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember that gig that where Pete was late? And, and you had to go on stage before Pete got there and Derek had to stand I in. Do. It was a really important show for Big Arm and Pete was late. Yeah. You, listen, right, you, you, <laughs> I lived through that. I was fit in the kitchen, like, in the morning yeah. and, and it overran, that's why I was late. So I get the train to London and then I get on the tube and uh, I've never got off the tube in Brixton before. So it's like, you know when you come off the tube in Brixton, there's like loads of yeah. steps in there and then you just come out onto the main street and it's like, whoa. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'm coming up these steps and Chris is at the top of the steps and he's like, quick, come on. <laughs> right, so I'm running down the street. <laughs> I'm running down the main, uh, the high street in Brixton, like follow, following Chris. We kind of legged it in the um, in the stage door, and he's like shoving me through, and then on the stage, and I put my bag down at the back of the stage. I walked on, took my coat off, put my coat down, tapped Derek on the shoulder. He got up and walked off, and I sat down and just started. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I was just like, like... <laughs> in the middle, was it the first song that you got? Was it was it the middle of the first song? I think so. Yeah. Well, it was nuts because it was like Brixton Academy with like. Oh, however many thousand people in there, yeah. it was just like. And were you two not? Were you? Were you? And and the rest of the band not panicking that 
Pete. No, no. <laughs> well, no. We knew he'd get them. No, we knew no. he'd get them. No. Plenty of time, you know. No. <laughs> Quick, Pete. Yeah, get in, Pete. man. Come Run on, you're going to be late. Run faster. For God's sake. Yeah, my name's Chris Connolly. I was a uh, driver roadie for Big Arm for around about two and a half years. And uh, I was known in Big Arm as Double Pudding and Chips. Because back then, I was 20 stone. And I loved that nickname. A lot of people would have got a smack off me for that nickname. But Paul gave me that nickname and I loved it. If they would have made a carry-on film about a band, <laughs> that was it. Being in Big Arm, being in and around Big Arm, what with Danny Short and all the lads. And Paul had his moments, he was hilarious. But me and Derek as well, driving to Berlin and back on our own, like Max and Paddy. Double Pudding and Derek drove out there, drove all the equipment there, didn't they? We flew out there. And when we got there, Derek were grinning and chuckling as soon as I got there. And I, I, th I thought there was something about to be sprung on us or something. I couldn't work out what it was. So then we pulls the van in and all these military come out with uh, trolleys with mirrors on checking because they had to lift all these sink all these steel posts into the ground so we could drive in and then all the posts come in proper military operation checking underneath for for bombs and devices and for oh this is full on and that right you can start unloading your gear so we start pulling it out and i don't know if you remember angela i bought off ebay it was like um, a missile artillery box and it was all khaki green with yellow military numbers all over it. But I used to put my effect pedals in there. They fit perfectly. And Derek, well, that's what he was sniggering at because he knew I forgot to change it. That should never have gone over. And uh, as the pulling out, I could see it. the last bit of gear come out and I could see it. And just as I'm going for it, I can hear Derek going, Daz, Daz, your box, your box. And I pulled it out. And this guard shouted that loud at me. I put my hands up. <laughs> he screamed at me. Put that down. He's one of them, Paul. He was he was kind of, um, you know, he was easy to make laugh. You, you know, he's quite a humorous fella. And um, I'm one of them if I'm working in a band or anything, you know, with anything that I'm doing, I like to be able to have a bit of banter and to be able to have a laugh and not take myself too seriously. I mean, there's like a common fallacy that if you're having a bit of a laugh and you're messing about, you're doing less work, you know, and that, I don't think that's necessarily always the case, you know. I'm not saying work the work environment should be like, a circus, you know, you should all be doing cartwheels and everything and, you know, red nose on you and everything. But, um, no, it, it, it was, it was encouraged, you know, Paul always encouraged everyone to be humorous and have a laugh and a joke. So when, when you played live, Pete, what did you actually do then? Cause if Derek was able to replicate you by pressing the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crosswords. A few bits missing, you know, but it was well, sparse, it was sparse, you know. I mean, it's it's a bit like, um, I was kind of putting the, the, the icing on the cake, let's yes. just put it, put it like that. So if, you, if you'd not shown up until six songs in, would people have noticed? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was there in spirit. Yeah. It was there in spirit. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I yeah, I did play some parts, but um, I probably also had them on track just in case I didn't feel up to it that night. <laughs> At the same time, guitarist Daz was also in an Oasis tribute band called Wonderwall. The first gig we did with Ian Brown was uh, Brayhead Arena in Scotland. I think it's about 20,000 people or something. So the night before, I'd been in Birmingham doing a massive gig, as far as I was concerned. And uh, there were about 3,500 there. And uh, we get to the Ian, but we went straight from that gig. I brought Wonderwall with me and we went straight to that gig. And I walked on the stage and the stage was bigger than the venue I'd played in the night before. 
And that was a bit of a... <laughs> so I've got two great memories, right, from that night. The first one is when we're sat in catering and Ian Brown comes in. We were at Soundcheck and uh, Ian Brown had just finished there. So we were on stage setting up ours. And then Ian Brown comes in screaming at everybody. Like, Where's my fucking pie? <laughs> who's this? Who's that old Miss Grand? Who's that old Miss Pie? And then, and then, and Went mad at everybody, stormed out. Come he on, storms right. out through this door, yeah. shuts the door behind him. And then, like, about 10 seconds later, he comes out and says, it's a cupboard. <laughs> How'd you get out of this fucking building? That's what he said. I remember uh, me and Lee kind of like, don't yeah. laugh, yeah. don't laugh. And I even remember Paul saying, for God's sake, just don't, just leave it. You know, just say you know? it. The other, the other on memory it. from that gig was like, uh, so we come on stage and I was like, oh, I've made it good here. I'm mm. in a band. I'm supporting Ian Brown. <clears throat> it's like 6,000 Caparina. I'm like, mm. this is going to be great. So we go up to play the first song. <laughs> Someone launched like a drink at me. And it was like one of those Blue Wicked drinks. Or oh, something. yeah. Just yeah, coated yeah. me a Thai keyboard. <laughs> it's just like really sticky. It's going to be like, one of those nights. I was like, oh, I'll just yeah. put it on track. <laughs> <laughs> That's that then, isn't it? <laughs> Cleaning it for oh, days. Oh, damn it. I mean, to be fair... Ian giving us them two shots was fantastic, weren't it? To get us out there, you, you couldn't ask for more. All oh, right, there's a good one. The Metro. The Metro, Metro Club, Club in Soho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zodiac Mind We Walk. played with Zodiac Mind Walk. Alan McGee were DJing. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so we, we'd done our spot, which went down great. And then we're in the dressing room just... Mopping our brows and getting ready to go, and this this uh, magician-looking fella walks in, mm. and he had a black cape on and a black hat and black shades and a yeah. cane. Yeah. And he walks in and he said, uh, "Well, you all look like you've done a bit, so if you want mine, fucking off, so we could do a bit." And mm. I'm looking, thinking, yeah. "This magic act has got a terrible <laughs> attitude." I didn't have a clue that he was a singer. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, anyway, Paul stood yeah. toe to toe and give it him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, me and Danny went upstairs yeah. thinking, I'm not standing with this prick. No, and no. then Paul come up and we went, I said, how did you know him? And he goes, I don't know him. <laughs> oh, all right. I thought you knew him. That's why I bought <laughs> second. I was Talk a, about yeah. backup. Yeah. Good luck, Paul. I always remember Paul saying, because uh, he said, didn't he? No, fuck <laughs> off. And Paul said, yeah. if you say fucking please, I will. Yeah. 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 He did not want to do that, like, did he? Oh. Um, so, yeah, so, he, um, <coughs> yeah, he really it's pissed off. us off. Uh, and he really pissed Paul off. Yeah. But, On a more uh, positive note, I remember I met a sex pistol that night. Paul Cook, come and watch in the us. audience, yeah. And yeah. so was Ian Astbury from the cult. Team That's right. Well. He was DJ. He was, yeah. Paul yeah. Cook was yeah. friends with Paul. Yeah, yeah he was. Right. We, we, I was sat talking mm. to him for ages. Mm. And then we left yeah. and Paul said, you haven't got a clue who that were, have you? And I went, no, why were you? <laughs> <laughs> I remember playing on stage and there was actually a light shining on Paul Cook. I could see his face <laughs> really, really vividly. It's like, there's a sex pistol. <laughs> <laughs> there's a sex pistol. Yeah. What did you think about Paul singing? Because... Obviously, that was a brand new thing for him from being a bass player. I've got it's kind of hats off to him because I I do quite a bit of singing in bands I'm I'm in, but I couldn't take my guitar off. I'd be naked. I, that'd be the most uncomfortable thing. So the fact that he actually had a go at that, oh no, I, I couldn't have. Uh, I could, I'd, have, I'd have had to have a guitar there even if I weren't playing it. The fact Paul stood up and tried that, yeah. That's uh, some doing that. Do you think he was yeah. trying to prove a point to his brother, doing Big Al? Um, I think he was trying to prove a point to himself that he's that he's that he's he's got this, you know, it's in his bones and his blood as much as anyone else's. I think he was trying to correct himself. I, I knew Paul loved talking ads and and loved that kind of stuff, and um, and I think that what we really weird for me was that obviously uh, all the bass was on track mm. so Paul could sing you know and I thought that was really cool that Paul just decided to you know he said he always said to me he said I want to be Brian Ferry in this band <laughs> I said well, I said to him well you've got you've got the air cut and you've got the leather jacket you know 
And um, and he said he said yeah I want to be you know I want to be cool in this band. He said I wasn't I wasn't cool in the Mondays. He said I want to be cool in this band. And do you think he pulled it off? I do because you know um, when Big Arm ran its course so to speak, and he got back in the Mondays, I think he was completely now ready to to get back in his rightful place and go for it big time and he definitely seemed to do that i think it served him well it it brought him back to in the end it brought him back to where he started do you think big arm would have been any different if he hadn't had his issues with drugs and stuff do you think that that really got in the way of the success i don't know i I wouldn't know what to say about that i mean yeah i remember a few relapses with him um but when we did come together, the job was always done. There were nothing kind of, nothing um, fell apart while we were halfway through anything. You know, there was yeah. stuff behind the scenes, but I, yeah. so I don't know. I, I, I think it ran its course. But there was one really bad memory for me when me and Pete ended up having to drag Paul out of a drug house. I remember, I have a very big... Very vivid memory <laughs> of driving yeah. with you to Gorton and going to that. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I remember it vividly. Yeah, I remember having conversations with you, um, and you saying that it disappeared, and he'd taken the car, and you you thought you knew where he was, but you weren't sure. Okay. Yeah, we went out for a drive round. We couldn't find him. And then we went out another time and then we... And he was there. But but I think we were in separate cars because I think I left you there with him because he said, oh, I've not finished yet. And I I went off and left you there with him. Do you you remember that? I've got so many memories that are a bit like that with Paul. And what, what the weird thing about it is for me is that, like... It's obviously different for you and different for other people in his life. But I always kind of, I, I, I always put it in a box separate to everything that everything else that was going on with me and Paul. It, it's weird, really, because um, I can remember when we first got married um, and we moved into that house next door, but one to Claire's mum and dad. So she came home one day and she's like, um, Paul had been around, been doing some writing and stuff. And she's like, um, what's what's with all the Kit Kats in the toilet? So I was like, what do you mean? She's like, oh, there's a load of Kit Kat wrappers. What's, what's been going on? I was like, well, nothing. Why? And I was like, it didn't dawn on me at all. And then we kind of, like, she was like, she kind of talked me through it and I was like, Right, okay, that kind of figures. So that was kind of when we first started working together properly um, right. outside of the studio. So I was like, right, okay. But I was like, well, that's nothing to do with me, what he does in his personal life. Like, we're just right. making music together. That was kind of before we became friends, if you like. Did you not get to the point, though, though where you knew Myloff, whether he was using or not? No. Well, I think, yeah, probably sometimes, yeah. But, um, yeah, I've never been good at that. Did you not feel traumatised? Like, that night when we went to that drug den to pull him out, did you not feel traumatised by that? Not really. I just felt a little bit embarrassed. For who? For all of us, really. It was just like, oh, what what is this? We're like, why am I here? (laughs) Like, I was there supporting you and him, but... It was just like, it was just like kind of a bit awkward. Do you know what I mean? It's like, ah, oh, hi, Paul. Fancy seeing you here. Because <laughs> his face was just like total shock when I pitched up. And I think he was, he was a lot more embarrassed that I was there. So, but, hi. but I mean, there's times when we had uh, the studio in New Mount Street when we were doing the Estrella stuff. And, um, and I can I can remember when we were setting it up, um, we we were putting like carpet over the walls and um, over a big frame. And he was kind of 
he was he was like half being sick in a bag underneath this huge roll of carpet while I was trying to nail it on the wall. And I was just like, oh, God, this is just like, it's hilarious, but also like terribly like tragic as well. There, there was one time when we were in there and um, there were loads of studios and management offices and stuff in there. And there was one day where we were looking after um, the neighbour's dog. And so I said to Paul, I got to lunchtime, I was like, I've got to go and feed the dog and let it out. So I'll be back in like an hour or something. So he was like, right, no worries, I'll stay here. So so I went off, fed the dog, um, came back and I opened the door and uh, like Paul sat there and then this other guy called Chris from around the corner in the office was sat there and they both looked up and they had like some foil like that and like just looked up at me in total shock. And Paul went, he made me do it. And Chris went, it was his fault. <laughs> And it was just like, come on, guys. Like, it's like having two kids. Like, I can't leave you for an hour without you going scoring. But um, it's just like, yeah, so I've always kind of, it's traumatic in a way, but I've always yeah, kind of put that in a box and said, well, that's, 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 that's his personal life, you know, because I, I've worked with so many musicians over the years that you have yeah. to kind of, you take them for their whole personality and everything but it's like if, if if I took on board his trauma and all the things that went along with that then I don't think I don't think we'd have done half the stuff that we did and yeah. and I don't think we'd have kind of continued with it really I think. and a lot of yeah. people musicians and people in the music industry have <clears throat> you know substance issues and, and addiction yeah. issues but somehow managed to function. I mean, you, you could say, you know, Paul managed to function over, you know, like four decades of being in bands and making music. Was it, was it functional? Probably not. But did he make the music? Yes. So. How different so. do you think his life would have been if he, if he hadn't had addiction issues? You know, it did drive wedges between him and other other people, which, yeah. you know, closed off yeah. uh, opportunities, yeah. I would say, definitely. But, um, I, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is um, a little bit uh, glib, but, you know, I think, yeah, you know, I, I work with a lot of musicians and they've all got demons of one sort or another. Um, yeah you know, and and that's part of what makes them what they are. It's part, part of what comes out in their art. It's it's like Amy Winehouse is a, is a prime example. You know, she, if, if you, you know, if you took, if you took all that side of her away, you know, would she, would she have made the art that she made? Right. And the answer and the is answer probably, no. probably yeah. not. Yeah. So, you, yeah. It's like saying if you if you took all that trauma and that addiction away from Paul, what would his personality be? How would he be creative? You know, and yeah. I so I don't think, you know, whilst he's yeah. undoubtedly probably not made the best of all the opportunities that he could have done, you know, would he have been able to do that if he was, you know, clean and it's hard really because it's it's so tragic when you see someone like Paul or like Amy Winehouse have that kind of that level of trauma that ultimately destroys them yeah. um but but then if you separate that away you be kind of taking a part of them away and the it, the line between kind of insanity and ge genius is so it, it, you can't yeah. kind of pull it apart, you know, and that's that's why I've always loved, like, really loved working with musicians because they they're just fascinating creatures, you know. They have so much going on um, yeah. beneath the surface, you know, and it's it's always been like, you know, I've always found it really interesting getting into people's heads, into musicians' heads, you know, and they're just fascinating yeah. creatures, really. They're just yeah. Yeah, you know, the most troubled, but also the most joyous people to be around. 
So tell me about your feelings about Paul as a human being. Oh, lovely fella. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could chat to him about anything. And he showed, you know, I'll tell you what, I will say this about Paul. He did show me um, what to stay away from, you know, because I, d I do recall thinking, uh, this guy's an happy Monday, you know. God, I could I could be getting into anything here. <laughs> and he just wasn't like that, that guy. And he told me everything about everything that had happened to him and everything what's happened to people and totally scared me away from the whole thing. He made it quite clear how damaging it is. What exactly? What you mean the drugs and the drinking or Yeah, what it had what it had done to him, you know? I remember we were sat up one night and I had a few beers. We we come back, we it might have been in on the green. Um me, Duffy and Russ dropped me off. Um and me and Paul sat up all night chatting. And uh yeah, I had a few beers with me and he's like, Well, you know, because because of what I've done, uh, I'm sat here having a, a coffee and a cig, you know. You've got the you've got choice. He said, I ain't got choice, I've had that took away because of how I behaved. He was really open and it totally, well, I, I say it to everybody, you know, if you, if you want to lose everything that you love, go straight into all that, you know. If you want to keep it, keep away. It's simple. Yeah. And that, yeah, I am very grateful for that, you know. Some of the things he told us, like when they went Brazil and that for the first time, just throwing it at them, throwing it at them. And that is a scary situation, that. How did you feel when when you found out the Mondays had got back together? Were you Did you feel good about that? Oh, I felt excellent. I was so... I've got to admit that, I, you know, uh, loving the big arm thing as much as I did, because I really did, the, the banter and the... the oh, it would, everybody involved, it was just such a joyous experience. But I was... As equally as happy when I to, when I learned that he'd got back in with that, I was so made up for him. It's like, well, the, you know, he he started this. He, he should be there, and to get it back, and then to get round the world. A few, I was I was so made up for him. I were buzzing for him. I really, well, I couldn't have been happier. I were happier with him doing that than coming back to us, because yeah. he he needed to be getting out doing what he's fantastic at basically. And when we went, remember when we went to the the first one they did at the GMEX when you and the lads come over, and we all went down, didn't we? Not the GMEX, yeah. it was the MEN. The MEN. And uh, yeah. what a gig! You know, like you know, have you heard that? <laughs> you know? yeah. And I'd not heard him do that. He didn't touch the bass when I was with him. I always saw a, a professional side of him, and he was always everything he ever said that he was going to do, um, with me involved in it, he did. So he was always, you know, he was always, um, always um, very, very um, courteous and he was always very professional and, and he was a friend. I considered him as a dear friend, you know, and he was somebody musically who I always had a good time on stage with. I never had a bad experience with him. And that was even with Buffalo 66 as well. Um, I loved him being in that band. He came up with some great bass lines that made that band, you know. Okay, so tell me about your days in the Mondays. Do you have any good stories of being on tour with the Mondays? Or, um... One of the funniest things with Paul, when he, he actually... Because uh, uh, Martin Herbert was his tech, was his technician. And he, he told, told me one day, he said, Paul's going to have, a, gonna have a, a keg at the side of his um, um, peg stack. And I said, what? So he said he's going to have a Stella keg and I went what, what for and he said because so he can pull his own pints in between the songs and I was like I don't believe you and, and honestly that just that that image of me of me on a riser playing with the Mondays and looking down and him pointing at me and the Trump we're trying to start a song I think we we're trying to start kinky afro or something and he's looking at me and he's going point trying to point at me and he's going do you want one and he's but he's like we're in a bar and we're playing somewhere like, we're playing somewhere like in Glasgow, you know, at the arena. And he's going, and he's like, hang on a minute, I'm just pouring a pint. And he's like, just making sure the head, the head went on properly. It was hilarious, honestly. It's so funny.
I remember being I remember being in Norway. We did a we did a festival in Norway, Christian Sand Festival, and we went on there. And somebody had as soon as as soon as we'd gone on there, I think somebody had had, had give Paul a V. He'd like he'd put two fingers up to Paul or something, or and 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 he it was like spoilt the whole gig for him, and he just wanted to fight him. And he was like, all the way through the gig, we started every song, and he was pointing at this person, and he, was, he had his bass, and he was going, after the gig, after the gig. And I've never seen, honestly, we did like an hour set, and he ran off the stage, and the security followed him. I don't know ever, ever what happened on that, but I've never seen somebody so upset as well. He was, and I said, what did, he, come up, he came up afterwards, I said, what happened? He said, he said he disrespected me. He said he put the visa up. As soon as I walked on stage, he decided he didn't like me. He said, I don't know who he is. And then on that same garbage were on with us, and on the same, we went backstage, and Paul just decided that he wanted a food fight, and we're in catering backstage. And honestly, it was like, it was like something out of a Western. It was just, food was flying everywhere. It was ridiculous. That was backstage at a festival, and Paul started that. I don't mind saying that, and I don't know he won't mind me saying that. So basically, um, the first time the Monday split up, uh, all of them raided the rehearsal room to get whatever they could sell for heroin, and um, or for other reasons. And Paul got the uh, sampler right, and. Um, so anyway, so that's how we came to write the, the big arm stuff. But we were always having to buy floppy disks to save the samples on. And um and and they were you know, they were like one pound fifty each or whatever. So he's like, Oh, I've got a box like I've got a box of old discs, you can like you can just wipe them and use them again, can't you? So I was like, Yeah, yeah, sure. So he bought me this big box of, of discs. And uh, and he says, yeah, just wipe them all, it's fine. So I was like, right, okay. So I got them open and I was looking at them and uh, it's the entire Happy Mondays collection of discs. So all the samples from like all the live stuff and they're all in a box like that. So I was like, well, um, I can just wipe these then, can't I? <laughs> of course, I was like, of course I'm not going to wipe them. It's mm. like... It's like history, isn't and it? And he still so, got them. No. So what happened was like, <laughs> sold them. <laughs> yeah, bet. Sold them for smoke. <laughs> yeah. So basically, right? No. So I, I close the box and I put the I put the box in my loft, right? And I was like, that's that's a piece of my history and a piece of Manchester history. I'm going to put them in a mm. in a safe place. So I put them there, and then he then disappeared off, and. Um, and then I'm I'm just at work one day and Claire phones me up and says, uh, yeah, Paul's been on the phone. Uh, he's, he's coming around, so you better come home. So I was like, what? What does he want? He's like, oh, he's a bit cryptic. So so I get, I get home and I've not seen Paul for like two years or something. And he's sat on my sofa. I'm like, hey, what, what are you doing here? So he's like, oh, well, the Monday's are getting back together and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, that's nice. He's like, do you remember them discs that you had? So I was like, what discs? And he says, uh, you know, those discs that I gave you and told you to wipe. So I was like, oh, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, and he's going, uh, he's going, did, did you wipe them? So I was like, yeah. So they both like looked at each other and just went, oh, oh we're doomed, basically. So I, I, I brewed up and I was like, no, actually, they're in the loft. <laughs> <laughs>
you remember the last time you saw him? Um, yeah, so when he got back in the Mondays, uh, me and Duffy, for some reason, we were over, we were over Worsley, and we were just coming up past Derek and Linda's house, and he stood there on the street waiting for his lift. It was so weird, because I thought you were in America. <laughs> like, what are you doing here? Yeah. But that was funny, because we were in our work clothes, so we jumped out, and uh, the look on his face was... Who the hell is this? You know, coming at him. <laughs> <laughs> but when he twigged, yeah, he was happy to see us. Yeah. Yeah, that was last last time. And uh, how did you find out that he died? It was it, I heard it from a friend, but I don't know where he heard it. But 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 I was told before anybody had heard it, so I don't I, I can't remember who it is who told him. But nobody else knew when I found out. So you're a bit like can't be, can it? Can't be real, that. But, yeah. Then it were on the news that night. Like, oh, it is real. Oh, dear. How did you feel? Gutted. Yeah, it's, it, you know, when you've spent quite a bit of time away from someone, you still know they're out there. And there's always going to be that time to catch up and have a brew and a chat. And it's that that never going to see him or speak to him again. That's uh, an awful thought. I miss Paul and I miss Derek as well, you know. There was always a, a respect with them. But Paul, I'm talking about Paul and Derek, was always stand-up geezers. I always seen them as stand-up geezers. Oh, I'm devastated, really. Yeah, really upset. I mean, last year, uh, my, my dad passed away uh, earlier that year in the uh, in March. It's, it's coming up for nearly 12 months ago since my dad passed away. He'd been very ill, you know, he was like nearly 80. And so I remember, funnily enough, just before, just after my dad passed away, Paul sent me a text saying, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear about you, you, your, your dad, you know, keep the faith, all this stuff. And, you know, really nice text. I said, oh, thanks, Paul. I had no idea that shortly afterwards he'd, he'd be meeting his maker as well. You know, it's just, um, no, it was a shock. Big shock. It's still, still strange, you know, thinking that he's not about. Yeah. I still ex expect to get that humorous little text off him now and again, you know, and uh, yeah. knowing that that's not going to happen again, it is weird. And um, it does, you can't help but get sentimental about it. You know, it's, um, it really does remind me of how special those times were back in the day, you know, with Big Arm, you know, and the, the, the good memories and I'm glad really, you know. Oh, thank you so much, all of you. You've been amazing. Really, really, thank, really thank good. You. Thanks for asking us. Yeah, thank you. No, 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 no. Like, you, it wouldn't have been the same without you. You're a very important part of his story. Very important part of his story. More than you know. Well, let's keep in touch and yeah, keep yeah, us updated, yeah. Angela. I can't Please wait do. to start yeah, seeing yeah. this. All right, fantastic. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much again. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Thanks, thank Angela. You. We're playing out with one of the singles from the Big Arm album. This is everyone's favourite, Sunrays. The album is out now under the name Paul Ryder's Big Arm, so get yourself a copy. Next week, we've got another bonus episode featuring an exclusive interview with Paul and Sean's mum, Linda. And that's before the grand finale of the main series, which is the following week. If you can't wait and you want to listen to the next episode straight away in podcast form, the audio version is out right now on all of the podcast platforms, so go and check it out. Please write some words for us if you've enjoyed the series and give us a nice review. Subscribe to this channel as we've got loads more great stuff to come. Check out our shop via the website paulrider.tv. Christmas is coming, so there's lots of gift ideas there. Join in the conversation on our social 
Rolls and please support us by becoming a patron of the show at patreon.com forward slash the Paul Ryder Tapes and help us to continue being able to bring you this content. Big, big love to each and every one of you and special thanks this week go to Pete, Daz, Danny, Lee and of course Double Pudding and Chips aka the Big Arm Boys and of course to the man himself the late, great Paul Anthony Ryder for making all of this possible. Lots of love to all of you. See you next week. Bye. Jamaica beaches now my home